don't be the best, but be the only. It's not at all evidence to ourselves what it is that we're better at than other people. And for most people, you'll spend your life working on this and that it's not a destination. You never arrive. It's a direction. Welcome to Technovation. I'm your host, Peter High. My guest today is Kevin Kelly. Kevin co-founded Wired Magazine in 1993, and today is the senior maverick at Wired. He also is the co-chair of the Long Now Foundation, a membership organization that champions long-term thinking. Kevin's the founder of the popular Cool Tools website, which has a daily review of tools for the past two decades. And in longer form, Kevin's also the author of multiple best-selling books, including The Inevitable, Out of Control, and What Technology Wants. His latest book is Excellent Advice for Living, Wisdom I Wish I'd Known Earlier, a book of 450 modern proverbs for what he refers to as a pretty good life. Kevin Kelly, welcome to Technovation. It's great to speak with you today. Oh, it's so great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate this uh, opportunity to share. Wonderful. I've, I've I've been looking forward to it. Well, Kevin, if I if I uh, if memory serves, the starting point for excellent advice for living was actually uh, dates back three years ago to your 68th birthday, when in your blog, the Technium, you offered 68 bits of unsolicited advice. And I wonder if you could take a moment and describe why then, why first of all, why 68 that that uh, that was the milestone you chose to to write these down, and and also just what the inspiration was to do so. 68 was 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 a random thing. It just it just uh, I was getting old, and I have three uh, kids, and they're young adults, and um, we were never very preachy with them, giving them advice. My philosophy for parenting was kids do not listen to what you say they only listen to what you do and so we were trying to do things as a means of training them and upbringing them but as i get older in 68 i started to for years just jot down things that i thought i was writing down to remind myself these are little proverbs to remind myself and because because i found that that reminder was a way to change habits and then I realized that actually I wish I'd known these earlier. And actually, I should tell my kids this. And so that was the sequence. And so I like the idea of the Irish or Hobbit birthday where you give presents away on your birthday. So I decided, well, I'm going to write some things down that I started to write down for myself that I wish I'd known earlier, that I wish my kids knew, that we actually say. And so I started to write them down. And... um and then I shared them and they went viral. And uh, then I did it for a couple more years because it turned out that once I got started, I had more to say. And um, eventually they were kind of spread everywhere. And I thought, I'd just like to put them into a book to hand my kids the book. And that was the origin of the book. It was sort of a very self-interested in a way of um, we're talking just to my adult kids. And then when they saw the book and read them, they said, you know, you never said those, but you did teach them to us. I thought, okay, mission accomplished. <laughs> That's really good. Um, but but they said we're glad that you wrote them down because they're they're easier to remember. Hmm. So um, so I think of these things as reminders, and and it's sort of like the book. It's just four hundred fifty little aphorism proverbs. It's kind of like the Bible without any stories, just the punchlines, and. That's my style is, you know, most of the vice books, they have pages and pages. They make great stories. Stories are the one of the best ways to teach. But it's not my way. My way is a little tweet. And so um, that's what they are, the kind of 450 little tweets, little reminders. I'm channeling the ancients. A lot of it is like necessary, not necessarily stuff that I invented, things that I've heard over my 70 years. But I try to put everything into my own words. And so that's the origin of this excellent advice for living. And, and I, I believe you've said uh, that the original subtitle was Seeds of Contemplation. Uh, it was rejected yes. by your publisher. But but actually, as I was yeah. contemplating that and then reflecting on the book itself, that did seem particularly apt. Yeah, yeah. So so because they don't have stories, they're kind of little mind grenades. They're kind of like the things that you can kind of conjure with and apply to yourself. And so there is a sense in which they are seeds that you should unpack yourself. And I have heard of people who, I wouldn't say they're kind of daily devotions, but they look at one a day. And we've talked about doing an app that would kind of feed you one a day where you kind of, there's a little thing, you kind of ponder it and conjure with it and 
contemplate and un unpack it over time. And they do work in that way where you can kind of just look at a few and you'll be reminded of something. One of the uh, intriguing recommendations you have, Kevin, is uh, you say, don't be the best, be the only. Yeah. And I'd love for you to, to describe that. And I must say, as I think about that, uh, you know, just on uh, prima facie, that's a pretty intimidating thing to <laughs> contemplate yes. because there are, you know, 7 billion of us out there and to seek the thing that we are the only of, well, that, that could be kind of difficult. Talk a bit about the recommendation as well as the, the method to use to, uh, to seek out one's unique spot. Yeah. I, 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 I want to acknowledge at the very start that this is a very high bar. The idea of don't, be the best, but be the only. Because for most people, including myself, it's not at all evidence to ourselves what it is that we're better at than other people and particularly what it is that we can do only. And I would say for most people, you'll spend your life working on this and that it's not a destination. You never arrive. It's a direction. And so what you want to orient your life to towards is towards that direction. And the even people that seem to be very accomplished and very successful in our terms. I have had the privilege of hanging around with like billionaires and they are also asking them the same question of what, what am I going to do when I grow up? And the thing is that having a billion dollars does not answer that question. It actually makes it more complicated. And so th this journey is, is, it's a journey of finding out what you're best at and, and you can kind of get closer to it over time. Um, and I think one of the ways that you do that is by, um, I think they're habits. They're, they're just, it's like anything else. You can go learn to, to do that. And I found myself asking myself all the time, is there, are there, are there other people doing this that, 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 that I'm doing that they could do it just as well. And so I have, I have less interest in it. One of the signals that you're in a good place is if you are working on something that people don't have a name for, what it is that you do. There's there, there's no label. There's, there's no title. It takes a half hour for you to explain to your parents what it is that you're doing. And that's a good sign that you are headed in the direction of being the only. Because what are you going to call it? And so... Um, and so in a certain sense, if you're at all able, you want to head in that direction. You want to head towards things where people don't know what it is and they don't have any language for it and there's no words. And that's that's a good place to be headed for. You also advise to prototype your life, um, a related topic, obviously. Uh, so as you're working these out, not necessarily taking big swings, but uh, but trying a variety of things in order to uh, distill down those ideas that might be your unique, your unique spot in the world. Can you describe that process? Yeah, yeah. So, 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 again, this is advice I wish I'd known when I was younger. But, uh, but I've come to to prototype everything in terms of like when I'm I'm a maker, I make things all the time. We did a I don't know ten years ago we did a huge remodel in our kitchen, and what I learned was to prototype. So with great big pieces of refrigerator cardboard boxes. We I made a whole mock-up of in 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 real scale and in, in life size of what the kitchen, the counters, and everything was going to be. And that taught us so much that um you want to know very early on. And when I make a book, I I in this book in particular, this advice book, I did several versions of prototypes of actually binding it, making a bound book to figure out the sides, to figure out uh, the the layouts. I prototype everything, and that includes my life, meaning that when we're trying something, you want to say, like, what's the easiest, most simplest, viable version of this that I can try to see if I like it? I changed my path when I was young. I wanted to become a photographer. I wanted to become a National Geographic photographer. And I was setting out to Asia to photograph and I called up National Geographic and I was trying to work with them to, to, to break into it. But as I got a few years into it, I started meeting National Geographic photographers. And after seeing what their life was actually like, I decided, no, I don't want to. That's not what I want to do. And it's sort of like 
people who spend four years in law school, graduate, get a law degree and go work for one year. And they're like, they hate it. It's like, well, why didn't you like intern at a law firm first? Why didn't you shadow somebody? Why didn't you spend some time seeing prototyping the version of it, you know, where you try things out. So that idea of trying small things, trying the, 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 the simplest viable version of something, like a prototype, a dummy, to explore is the most efficient way. And in, in if, if you're just looking at it in a productivity way, it was to be the best. But what it does is enables you to try lots of different things. It enables you to explore, to, 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 to sample, to make sure that you're headed in the right direction. I mean, the, the worst misguided kind of productivity is, is to do an excellent job of something that doesn't need to be done, right? I mean, you, you want to make sure you're doing the right thing before you do it. Just doing things well is not enough. You have to really spend time in making sure you're doing the right thing. And that requires exploration. And more than just thinking about it, and that's my point, is that we have thinkism where we think we can think about things, but I found that doing things, trying things, trying it out is often the fastest way to learning about it, that, that, that there's a limit to what we can think about. And that's true about technology, by the way. We tend to be, we can think about all the things that AI can do. It doesn't really matter. We actually have to use the AI to figure out what it can do. And the same thing with our own careers is you want to be going, you want to go through experience and trying stuff as a way of thinking about it. That's the best way to think about things. And if you're going in a certain direction, you want to prototype that, try it in turn, try it out, visit shadow, all these other things, take six months, do a little trial, startup, whatever it is, that's the way you want to move forward. And, and I, you know, I think there's a tendency, especially for young people, Kevin, um, to, 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 to get on the hamster wheel of one's career, focus on a single yeah. job in a single industry yeah. and, you know, ride yeah. that out for multiple decades. Um, perhaps uh, in the early days of, of Wired, for instance, yeah. you had a singular focus given all that you had to do in order to stand that up as an example. Uh, you know, you've sort of in some ways earned perhaps quite literally and figuratively uh, much more diversity. And, yeah. and forgive me, I, I may be m mis uh, typifying your your career, but I think for a lot of people, the thought of having this varied set of experiences, a portfolio of activities uh, from which they derive, um, uh, you know, a, a career money satisfaction is sort of foreign to them. And I wonder, especially for those who are who are younger or with less means, um, how you think about as as a lot of this advice, as you mentioned, you yeah, wish yeah. you'd known earlier, what you would have changed, if anything, about your twenties and perhaps areas of of focus in some areas versus others. The thing about prototyping is that it actually favors those with very few resources. Is is that you can, I mean, you know, cardboard. Think of you're going to do a cardboard version of your career or whatever, or your your your, your ambition. You can do everything in cardboard first. It's free, it's, it's easy, it's cheap, it's fast. You can make a mistake, you can change things. So you want you you want to kind of do your career in cardboard, which you can do if you're poor. Yeah. And when I was growing up in the 50s, there was certainly the model of, you know, one career, lifelong employment, um, paternalistic companies that took care of you and treated you well, and that you kind of wanted to, specialize and master in that sense. And, and I think most people understand that that's just not the current environment and certainly not the ideal. And that even in college admissions, they have this thing called, what was it called? It's called the, um, the rounded sharp. So this is idea that they'd like to find people who have actually this huge variety of stuff with one little sharp, distinctive, focus so they like so they don't want something that is like completely no focus whatsoever they don't want something over focused so money they like this idea of kind of a general thing with a little hook of one thing that seems kind of promising and i think that's uh i think that's kind of a portfolio that people are looking for when they're hiring at least i was 
when, when we were hiring is I want someone who has an overview, has a good big view of of world and, and of themselves, who has tried enough to know themselves a little better. And that's what these experiences, these prototyping experiences give you is some sense. And that informs them and makes whatever focus they are going to aim towards right now, richer and deeper. And so I would say, if you find that people are not interested in your kind of varied background, don't work for them. Absolutely do not work for them. You want to work for people that you want to become. That's one of my bits of advice. Don't work for someone you don't want to become. You want to find the kind of people who are more interested in that varied experiences because that's who you want to be. You want to have as many experiences as possible. This is a very short ride that we're given. And believe me, um, you want to say yes to as many experiences as you possibly can. Yeah. You know, I was, I've been struck, Kevin, in following your work for some time that in many ways, you know, the, the way you modeled your career early on has become more the norm, but yeah. the time at which you did did the things you did, absolutely rapid. not the case. So you no. dropped out of college, frankly, at a time when that credential was incredibly important, right? And much less so today and all sorts of yeah, successful yeah. entrepreneurs. It's almost like a badge of honor to get into an elite college yeah. and then drop out from that elite college. Exactly. It was definitely not a, <laughs> it was very embarrassing to, to many people, not to me, but to many people. And I went to a high school in Westfield, New Jersey, where I 98% uh, everybody went to college and it was totally what you expected. And um, um, so, I mean, I have very few regrets. I actually regret that one year. I, I wish I had not even done that one year, but I did learn other things. And so um, that is, you're right, That that's uh, the gap year. If I had had a gap year, man, I'd probably still be in college or internships, those kinds of things. That's what I was hungering for, but I could not sit in a classroom for grade 13 and 14 and 15. It was like, it was going to kill me. And so, um, so yeah, we've, we've gotten wiser as a society when I think is really, really great. And I urge young people all the time, take a gap year. My gosh, come on, do something. I, my own, my own kids, my own son, he did not take a gap year. He, went to school and then started working and I took him aside and I said, look, you need to goof off. You need to take some time off and waste some time. You know, you, I mean, he was in bilingual school and college prep and a really intense high school that was better than college. And it was like, man, you know, and so um, he, oh, he was thinking of going back to school for a, a degree in uh, fine arts, MFA. And I was like, look, Here's what it is. Why don't you do your own MFA? We'll support you. Do your own MFA for a year. Make art for a year. And then give yourself, you send out your stuff to, to some teachers you know, get get your, your thesis done, do a thesis, and then award yourself your own degree. And which he did. And that was liberating. That was just liberating because... He was in total control. He, he he could do whatever he wanted to, and he needed to do that for the first time in his life. And so, um, I, I yeah, I really think that um, young people are, are and, and again, I know people are confined to what the choices are because of the family circumstances, but I've been around the world in places that have, have true inv uh, pervasive poverty. I mean, not just some families where, where basically nobody has cash and some people are still much more innovative and able to, to try things because they choose to, no matter what your resources, you still have ways that you can prototype things. It's not a matter of being privileged and having the resources. Sometimes not having the resources are some of the most powerful benefits that people have because they are forced to invent wholly new ways that otherwise people would try and purchase and use money for and they're not going to find it if you're forced to because you don't have the resources you can be you can actually discover things that, that people with money can't yeah you you mentioned a related topic that uh 
you don't need more time. You need more focus. Right. Uh, the people underestimate the amount of time that they have. Uh, you also say the same for money that uh, you right. don't they need as much money as you as you might right. think if, in order yeah, to. If most, if most people track the amount of money that goes through their lives. They're they're, they're shocked. <laughs> I mean, a middle a middle class American will have millions of dollars flow through them over the course of their lives, and it's like. Okay, it's, so it's a matter of like how much of this are you going to actually manage and catch, so to speak, because you're actually processing a high degree of money flowing through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of your most famous blog posts was from 2008, uh, where you wrote, to be a successful creator, you don't need millions. You don't need millions of dollars or millions of customers, millions of clients or millions of fans. To make a living as a craftsperson, photographer, musician, designer, author, animator, app maker, entrepreneur, or inventor, you need only thousands of true fans. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, unpack that a little bit further, if you would. I, I, again, I think something that would be very surprising for people, they, they think that uh, you know one needs to be Taylor Swift or the Rolling yeah. Stones uh, or JK Rowling or uh, in order to, to, to have a fulfilling and and a life that offers appropriate remuneration. Uh, talk a bit about that insight and the pathway to, to to getting those thousands of true fans. Yeah. So 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 you you, you suggested the the orthodoxy, the conventional wisdom, is and and people today, the influencers, they're all hoping for massive success, where they have millions of followers, they have this sell millions of things they've got a blockbuster a bestseller a platinum record and the problem with that is that that's a very scarce niche that's well occupied and allows only a very few people to even ever attain that but with the new technology that we have in the internet and beyond is is that you don't actually need that if you kind of redefine your idea of success. And that's part of what the larger project is. If you wanted to make a living rather than a fortune, you need in the thousands of fans, if you can use technology to get their purchasing power directly to you. Right now, Taylor and everybody else, they're not getting all the money that goes to the ticket or the CD, whatever it is, there, there's lots of people involved in between. So they have to have a lot more people to make money. But if you could have, if you could have your fans pay you directly, then you only need an, an order of thousands of them who are paying you directly every year. And therefore that is a much more attainable size, but it requires that you have direct interaction with your fans um, that it's also that's that's another job, and so cultivating and 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 nurturing those fans requires some work. But if you're willing to do that kind of work, you could actually make a living, not a fortune, with a thousand true fans. But those thousand true fans, of course, are your true fans. They're going to be the people who buy whatever you make. But around them, concentrically, are you know casual fans and stuff. So. And, and your true fans become your marketers. They they start marketing for you. So the idea is that there's an alternative. And it may not be fit for everybody because it does take time and certain personality to engage fans. But it's a much more attainable goal than imagining that you have to have millions or billions to be successful. Um, and so, so that's what it is. And even if you never go to be fully self-sustaining with a thousand true fans, any any movement that you make in that direction is helpful. So, you know, I do self-published books with a thousand true fans, but I have books like this one, which is published by Penguin and is not based on that. But 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 still I move in general towards trying to have a thousand true fans. And any movement in that direction will be useful to you and more like you'll more likely be able to attain your definition of success. I'm curious, um, you know, when you were a, a younger man, how you would have defined what success looks like and how, yeah. that, how that differs from how you would define it today. That's a good question, because when I decided to drop out of college, I had a very different idea of success at that time. Success for me was not to have it was I was probably I was signed up to be poor. I was going to be poor, but I was going to be 
time rich. I would have control over my time and I would spend my time making things that I cared about. I wasn't trying to sell them. I didn't care whether there was a million fans. I was, it was much more kind of a personal arty thing. So I imagine my idea of success was having a house that I built myself, um, having control of my time, making art as much as I could following, I have, you know, having a little laboratory and workshop where I can make, things and and which and so that was my definition that's what i was signing up for it i was probably going to live somewhere where it was really cheap to live far out in the sticks and um for me that's what my success was i think what we want for everybody is for you to to, to have your own definition of success my mind has changed over time but it's still in that same vicinity of having um, i don't care about how much money i have I, ha I care about how much time i have I have a countdown clock, how many days I have left. I'm really very, very focused on the time aspect. So I am, t I want to be time rich. I don't care about the cash, time rich. That definition that you or I or someone else has is is the most important thing in terms of your, your career. And I think what we want is, what I would like to see is people coming up with new definitions of success. The Amish friends that I have, their definition of success is, is, can I have every meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner with my family and kids until they grow up? So the, that's a big thing. That's why they have their, their schoolhouses just down the street because they come back for lunch to the family for lunch um, from school. So, so they have this definition of community, family, community, and you're successful if you can achieve those things. It's nothing to do with amount of money or anything or fame. It's 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 community and family, and so that's a great definition of success for them. And what we want is people to have one other than I want to be a I want to be an NBA basketball star because that is very rarefied. There's only a couple people in the world that are even physically able to do that. You want to have a different definition of success. You're, you're Kevin, known as a radical optimist, mm -hmm. uh, and I wonder what the source of your optimism is. What do you what, what do you think it is? I think pers I have a temp optimistic personality. I've always had one, but I have decided I've made a, a optimism a choice. I've I've just deliberately become more optimistic. So I, I think it was naturally optimistic, but now I'm radically optimistic, and that's been a choice. And that choice has come, what has allowed me to do that is by reading history. The more history that I read, the more evident that it becomes to me that progress is real and likely to continue because the conditions are the same. And if progress continues, then we can be optimistic about it. The second reason, uh, my source of my optimism is in my time with Long Now Foundation and getting a longer view. So the longer your view into the future, the easier it is to be optimistic because over the long term can overcome fairly drastic setbacks. Even large setbacks can be overcome over the long term. And thirdly, my source of optimism, my deliberate optimism has come from my realization that if I, we look around our room, whatever room you're in or your listeners are in, and look around, all the things, all the cool things in that room were created by optimists. They were made by people who believed that these things could be at a time when probably most people did not believe that was possible. Whether that's an LED light, whether it's a microphone that's got some screens, I've got window glass. I mean, th these were all made by optimists. So the optimists have shaped our, our current world. And in the future, the people who make the world are going to be the optimists who believe that things are possible. And I think it's really unlikely that you can have a world that you want in the future, that we like, that's friendly, that's humane. Um, we, I don't think we can get there accidentally. I don't think we can just sort of bumble our way. I don't think it happens where you inadvertently make this really complicated thing that works. You have to have a, a vision, a picture in your head. You have to imagine that it's possible. Imagine what could be possible and imagine that you can make it. And that's called optimism. 
it's the optimists who are going to be shaping our future. And I want to be one of those. I, I really like that. It, you, uh, I was listening to an interview that you gave where you talked about how bad things happen fast, good things happen slowly. And as a result of that, news cycles uh, naturally have a tendency to uh, over-index bad things. Uh, you made the point that if newspapers uh, published once every decade, it would be nothing yeah. but good news. But because they're daily, or in some cases, of course, uh, uh, right, much right. more frequently than that, if they're digital, uh, the tendency is to focus on the bad thing that happened yeah. yesterday, the bad thing that happened last exactly. week, the bad right, thing that's right. going to happen tomorrow. Um, right. talk, talk a little bit about that insight. Again, I guess it draws back from your appreciation and study of history as well. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you, you said it very well that, you know, um, I, I can almost guarantee you that um, was whatever has happened in the last five hours is bad news. Okay. <laughs> it's, and so it's, so you don't want, you don't want the news to be framing your, your, your view of the world. You can't ignore it in a certain sense, but you don't want it framing how you think about the world. You don't want it framing what it is that you do because the news by definition is going to be bad. And so um, the longer the view you can take, the more optimistic you can become. And so uh, the, the the thing about optimism, there, and one of the reasons why I'm optimistic is, is not because I think our problems are too few. I'm not ignoring our problems. I'm not diminishing them and in fact i think the problems we have ahead are going to be bigger than ever we're going to we're going to have we're going to have with ai and stuff we're going to have problems that will just will just astound us how big and complicated those problems are but i'm optimistic because i think that our ability to solve problems is even bigger and so um so my optimism is in our ability to kind of keep inventing better solutions better tools for making solutions improving the way that we solve problems. That's where the optimism lies. That's where I'm, we trust the future. We trust the young people. We trust the fact that we have progress. And that trust comes from the fact that we've had progress for 400 years. That could end tomorrow. It's possible. It's greater than zero, but it's highly unlikely. So if you are just looking at it in a rational way, You'd have to say progress will probably continue, and that that progress is the source of our optimism. Those insights, um, how does it impact your own diet of news or social media or the way in which you kind of uh, uh, draw from the world as to what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, yeah. So the, the news is, it's sort of like the news is obscuring the real news. There is a sense in which, you know, the he said, she said, who's first, who's second, what's happening. Um, th there is a sense in which that obscures the long-term things. And so I have to wade through the news. It's something that I wade through to try and find the signals for that, which is going to sustain over time. I find it often in science, science, Stuart Brand says science is really the only new news, all right? So so science has a lot of that sense of stuff that is the signal. Uh, also, um, usually stuff that's not on the front page is, is things that are likely to have a longer term impact, things that are not, you know, leading and bleeding that are signals, again, of, of things that are going to really change over time or improve over time. So, 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 so I, I, I try, I look at the headlines and, and um, I, I have a couple of, I have a website that I look at that has all the headlines for the entire internet, all on one page. And I can go through that pretty, pretty quickly um, and clicking on things that I, if I want to read more. And for me, I think that's, that's about the level that I need. So I am aware of the context of things but I'm going to drill much deeper on things that I think are going to be enduring over time. Yeah, very, very interesting. Another concept of yours that I find so interesting is that of pronoia. There, yeah. There's a lot uh, that we, we consume in, again, in news or through social media or even interactions with, with friends but at times that has a tendency to lead to paranoia. 
and you, uh, you, you suggest that we focus on pronoia. Uh, define the term, if you would, and the, the rationale behind that. Yeah, so, so paranoia is the delusion, the conviction that people have that the whole world, the universe, has conspired against them. Everywhere they turn, there are people working to thwart them, to take them down, to stop them, hurt them, whatever. And pronoia, the opposite, is the conviction that everybody in the world is trying to help you. They're working behind your back. There's a conspiracy to aid you. That everyone wants to you to succeed. And I think it's a better delusion to have. If you assume that, it's funny because it begins to actually work. It's like, you know, and, and that's because if you trust people, they will give you their best. When you have pronoia, you begin to suspect that everybody's trying to help you. You treat them very well, and then therefore they begin to give you their best. And this becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy in a certain sense, where you are you're being kind and then you're being kinded back. And that one little delusion of believing that people are actually working to help you, they will work to help you. I mean, that's a curious thing about the universe. There's so many paradoxes about the universe. And one of them is that the most selfish thing you can possibly do is to be generous, right? I mean, it's like if you were just a scheming Machiavellian, you know, rationalist who's like, I am just going to, I, I want I want to be as selfish as possible. The answer is, is that you should be generous because you're going to get paid way back more than you give. And that's just kind of weird, but that's how it works. That's very interesting. I, I'd love to turn to towards uh, technology and artificial intelligence uh, areas that you've been been mm -hmm. thinking about, writing about for quite some time. And in fact, it is the fact that you've got this long sweep of history across your career. You've docu documented numerous tech cycles. Yeah. And I wonder what, what you draw, continuing a theme from throughout this conversation of what history teaches us about the future, what you draw from past cycles that provide insights into where we are today. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so obviously, or the you know, AI has been coming for a very long time. In fact, I don't, I can't think of a single other phenomenon or or technology that has been talked about for so long before it even existed. I mean, you know, science fiction has been talking about AI for decades, for maybe a century before it was real. So we've been rehearsing things like crazy. It's the most rehearsed, anticipated thing ever in human history. And yet, yet in the last year, there was a shock. Everybody was shocked. But that the thing that people had been talking about for so long was seeming suddenly happening. And it was shocked because even the fact that people are talking about it, there are a lot of people who just denied that it would ever happen. Okay, so Jack Chibi Chi just been passing, um, you know, AP, high school, college tests all across the board. And there were, I mean, there were people who said that simply wasn't going to happen. And so, um, so there's a shock. We have a tendency to confuse a clear vision of the future with a short distance. I think what's happening in the hype cycle right now is people think that this is going that the the next levels were going to happen very, very quickly and that we're going to be taken over that we're all going to be losing jobs by next summer and that um, you know the cars will be driving themselves and we'll be all fired and maybe in two years from now the, the robots will kill us. And that's just that's all just romance, romantic fantasy. It's it's almost a kind of a religious idea. So so I think the reality is is that it's going to take a long time for a lot of these things to penetrate deeply into our culture, into a society. I mean, almost nobody has to worry about being fired because of AI, just because of AI. There are some people, help desks, people who are working in remote call centers. Their their jobs are in jeopardy. But man, that's not a job a human should be doing anyway. But 
for most people, this is not, this is going to take a long time. It's going to take decades, I think, before we have uh, uh, cities full of self-driving cars. And that's because just like the transition we went from horses to cars, the cars couldn't drive on the same roads, the same kind of roads that horses had. They had to rebuild the whole road system. And we're going to have to rebuild the road system to accommodate AI, self-driving cars and trucks. And that's the thing about the AI as it comes into like corporations is you can't just bring AI and have it replace a person. You have to change the nature of the organization itself to accommodate the AIs. So, so in the same thing with electricity, you can't take it. You can take a regular 19th, 18th century company or organization and bring electricity into it and electrify it. You actually had to actually the shape of the organization itself, the the the, the structure, the architecture it changed because of electricity. And the same thing with AI is that we actually have to change the organization architecture of institutions to accommodate the AI. And that is what takes the time. The AI can kind of be kind of fancy and good in the laboratory, but actually putting it into real life will take time. So one of the first things I would say is that this is going to take a lot longer than people tend to think, given the, 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 the shock of ChatGBT. It's we we have a long process, which is good news, because it gives us time to adjust and guide it and regulate it and all these other things that it needs. So the 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 vision of the singularities where this happens so rapidly that we suddenly make that we're displaced is just not that's not that's a fantasy. And, and so, do do you believe, uh, Kevin, that our ability to thwart what potential issues are out there? given the time that we have necessary, yeah. the issues that are articulated are overblown as a result of that? Yes. I mean, I, there's several things. There's there's whole industry of AI safety. And there's there's there are real issues, and then there are kind of imaginary issues. The real issues are things like bias and autonomy, context for decision-making. Those are real things, the, the real challenges. The, the the fantasy ones are that they're they're, they're going to take over and kill us and that they're um, existential threat stuff. That's not a real threat, and so um, and that sometimes distracts from the work on the other issues about how to overcome. I think also the copyright issue is a, is also a not a real thing. That's clearly. Um, we need other kinds of, of rights and uh, protections for the IP other than copies because it's just there are, no, there are no copies. So it's just that's just a legal that's just a legal thing that we have to kind of overcome. But that's another example where we there are lots of distractions as well as some legitimate stuff for the safety issues. Yeah. Um, but but it'll, and here's the thing that I, I keep repeating is, is that. We're susceptible to thinkism in this, which is thinking about things as a way of solution. And the thing about AI is that the people who invented it have no idea what they're good for. And it's only through using them that we're going to determine what works, what doesn't work, what the problems are, what isn't. So we can't just regulate on what we imagine might happen on all these things, on what we imagine a third person might experience. No, we have to actually have evidence-based policy based on actually what happens when we use these so it takes it's going to take several generations of using them in order to figure out what they're good at what they're not good at what they what, what they cause harm or not and not from just imagining them and the evidence so far again how many people have been fired from ai almost almost nobody that's the evidence let's look at the actual evidence let's not think about some fantasy let's talk about Actual unemployment evidence, zero, or very, I mean, there's there's hundreds, okay? And so it's the same kind of thing. Let's look at actual harm caused to an artist. Not much. So if we have an evidence base through use, and that takes time, and that's what we want to be basing our policy decisions on. Yeah, and it's interesting as, as 
one thinks about the areas where, where the greatest progress has been made in recent months, especially as understood by a lot of the population with the, the, the advances of LLMs, the yeah. introduction of ChatGPT uh, 3.5 roughly a year ago, uh, writing, uh, the creation of art, uh, two areas, for example, that you spend a lot of time on. You, you are, mm -hmm. of course, a, 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 an author uh, in short and long form alike. You create a piece, some sort of art as, uh, on a daily yeah. basis. Mm -hmm. um, no doubt you have been uh, immersing yourself with the progress of yeah. the technology. And in I know you're incorporating it, in fact, into the work that you do. Yeah. What, 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 um, what, what's your own insight about that partnership between artificial intelligence and you, the human, uh, and what satisfaction are you drawing out of that new, par relatively new partnership or advancing well, partnership, perhaps better, better put? Yeah, I mean, I, I like the way you're framing because I think that is the correct one, partnership. I mean, so, so that's what we're discovering so far. Um, and, and that's very much how I approach it and how I'm using it. And and um, because, I, you know, I make uh, AI art and I spend, like I was just last night, I spent an hour making an image. Which means that at the end, I am very, very comfortable in co, co-signing this because um, it's 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 a collaboration. It's absolutely a collaboration, and it's the same kind of thing with photography. When the painters were alarmed when photography came on, so you're just pressing the button. Well, we know that photography is not just pressing the button. You you have an eye. You have to you have to stalk. You're going through. You're navigating. You're selecting. You're curious. It's 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 an art to just press the button. And the same thing with AI art. It's not just clicking. There is a collaboration that's necessary to get anything that's really good. And that collaboration is in part because there are some things that AIs can't do. Right now, because they're tethered to large language models, they can't really generate things that can't be described in words. And there's lots of art that cannot be described in art. So they can't reach those right now. Secondly, it's it's because the audience for this is still human. And I have a better idea of what humans like what, than the AI does. There is It's a collaboration. And we know, again, from other fields, like, say, medicine, that people prefer, or that if we look at the skill of a, of a doctor, a human doctor, that the AI doctor is not quite up to that skill, although they may at some point, but that the combination of the human doctor plus the AI doctor is better than either of them by themselves. And that's because the AIs think a little differently. They get to things in a different way than we get there. And that is their main benefit, is they think a little differently. And so th the idea that there's general intelligence, I think is a misguided idea. There aren't, there are only specific kinds. They're all, they're all they're very, very specific. And our, even though we you can solve the same problems like math problems, the way that they do it is slightly different. They don't do it the way that we do it, and that means that there are problems that they're going to be able to solve that we can't, and vice versa. And so this idea of partnering with AIs, plural, many many kinds, many varieties, is really the stance that we're going to work at, and that we can use them for things that. We want and so we're figuring out the best use of these for writing what they can do really well that they can't we will continue to make them do more and more things but it's an engineering truism that you cannot optimize everything you always have trade-offs and ais that are really good in these things will not be as good as some other ais in these other things and so we're going to be optimizing and engineering and architecting all kinds of things. Um, and like having a bunch of tool sets in front of you, you're going to be picking up different things and learning. The, the, the pros will learn, if I really want to accomplish this, this is the kind of AI that I need. This is what I need to say. And they're going to be really good at it. And they're going to be better than other people because they spent their 1,000 hours doing it. And so I, I see this world that we're headed to of AIs as collaborators, partners, guides, interns, coaches, this where we're kind of shoulder to shoulder rather than face to face. Shoulder to shoulder is sort of the the the, the metaphor. And um, some people will be better than, than others because they're going to spend the time getting to know them and figure out what, what works. Um, and so I think the, the idea that they're 
working against us is unhelpful. Another insight, Kevin, that I really admire about you is, um, although you're, especially of late, a, a famous advice advice giver. That's the na- yeah. nature of your latest book. Um, you quite humbly state that you you uh, you know that you don't own the truth, uh, and I admire yeah. that you seek out partners and interlocutors with whom you enjoy disagreeing, as you put it. Right, um, right, right. Disagreeing in an additive way is another way in which you you formulated it. That's a good way. Yeah, yeah. And talk talk a bit about you know that process, that knowledge seeking, and, and ensuring that you are surrounding yourself not with people who uh, are simply doubling down on what you believe, but actually actively seeking out those who would call into question, but in a productive way, what you believe. Yeah, um, I, I like to change my mind and have my mind changed. Uh, there was a little saying that you're only as young as the last time you changed your mind. And that process is very invigorating. Um, and so, I, uh, you know, again, I read a lot of history. And one of the things I know from history is um, how often people were wrong in history in the past. And being a rational person, that means that by my calculation, there's a whole bunch of things that I believe that are just totally wrong. I would love to be, you know, remedied of that while I was still alive. That would, nothing would make me happier. And so, um, so I'm always asking myself, you know, am I wrong about this? Um, you know, I have, I have some things that things I've just stated right now that I may be totally wrong about. And so um, I'm looking for evidence that I'm wrong. This was Darwin's great talent when he was writing his book about evolution was he loved to correspond and accumulate arguments about where he was wrong. And, and he kind of was always kind of working through that. Maybe, maybe he was wrong. Where am I wrong? How can I get better at this? And so um, I don't know, there seems to me to be a joy in having your mind changed and I think part of that joy comes because the people that I admire the most are able to change their mind. So I want to be a, a person to be admired because the people I admire change their minds when presented with the evidence. There's nothing more powerful than that, I think. Yeah. Well, Kevin Kelly, thank you so much for, for generously sharing a bit about what's in your mind uh, and your <laughs> writings. It's been a delightful conversation uh, and, and I greatly appreciate you making time for me today. Well, thank you. You have great questions, Peter. I really enjoyed it. You asked some questions that hadn't been asked before. That's always nice. So thank you um, for your attention. I really appreciate it as well. Oh, I'm so grateful for it. Thank you. Yep. Be well. All right. So I, long, I, everybody. I, I hope our paths cross again soon. I do wish that as well. Thank you.